everyone, should be here. Today, I want to talk to you guys about the U.S. during World War I and the home front, meaning what was going on at home uh, in the continental U.S. So to start, you guys can open up the graphic organizer home front. Okay, so why this matters. Uh, first of all, what we're going to discuss in this lecture is war's indirect effects. So not just its effects on soldiers, but also the effects on people at home. So that soldier's family, that soldier's wife, um, their kids, the company they used to work for, that sort of thing. Uh, this matters because it's going to also, World War I, I mean, is going to permanently change the relationship between Americans, government, and their economy. And we'll talk more about that. It's also going to be, uh, we're going to see a military draft put in place for World War I. And that is huge. That is very important. And we're also going to see a couple mass migrations in the U.S. Uh, we've seen this trend before, and we'll talk more about push-pull factors later. And our lesson essential question uh, for today is how did the war affect Americans at home? So uh, to start, uh, before I hit the next slide, I, I wanted to show you guys, uh, we'll be looking at a couple of these. These are recruitment posters that you would see in the United States uh, to try and get you to join uh, the Marines, or we'll see some other branches of the military. So this one says, go over the top with the U.S. Marines. And it shows a soldier with a Lewis gun, American flag. We've got a line of bayonets going over this trench. And as you guys learned from before, going over the top normally meant uh, you were running into machine gun fire. So, yeah, <laughs> this uh, going over the top is not a good thing at all. Uh, for those veterans that knew it, if they saw this poster, I don't know what they might think. Moving on. So here's another poster. I like this one a lot because uh, the artwork's really cool. Uh, it says, treat them, treat them rough. Join the tanks, the U.S. Tank Corps. Open to fighting men. So these are uh, Mark, uh, I'm not sure which model, but these are the Mark One, potentially Mark II model tanks used by the United States and Britain during the war, uh, briefly. Unfortunately, if you were in one of these, these things were basically death traps. Um, a lot of s soldiers who worked in the tank brigades would go right out of the tank directly to the field hospital. I mean, I, not, if, not because they got shot, but because it was so hot and so unsafe in these machines, you would be breathing in fumes, smoke, uh, cramped area, you'd be in a very cramped area. So joining the tank battalion, not quite as nice as it might look. The second one is for the artillery, and it's saying adventure and action, enlist in the field artillery. Um, an interesting thing about this poster is most, a lot of the casualties during the war are actually going to be from artillery. Uh, meaning you're going to get shelled and bombed by somebody you can't see 10 miles away. Um, and I don't know about adventure and action, but I guess you could say that. <laughs> Sorry, it's just adventure and action is not what you normally think of when you think of artillery. Um, and then the last one's my favorite. Uh, the Navy put them across. It just seems like the art style gets more and just worse and worse with each poster. This one has a poorly drawn naval officer giving a piggyback ride, I guess, to a soldier who's very happy to go over. And it says the Navy put them across. Uh, this one looks like it was drawn by a fourth grader. Um, but hey, who am I to judge? I don't make any recruitment posters, do I? Okay. So now that I've shown you uh, some Army recruitment posters and rambled on about them for a bit, we'll talk about how the U.S. Um, actually built an army. So before the war, you can see uh, standing armies and reserves right here in August of 1914. And if you notice, the U.S., only has 200,000 soldiers and men ready to be mobilized. So that's including National Guard and the Army. Uh, the U.S. compared to, like, look, Greece has more than us right here. Now, you will see, though, that the forces mobilized here, the U.S. is going to go from 200,000 to over 4 million. And going back to Greece, that's their total number of soldiers. So we went from this to that. And the real question is how. So to answer that question, 
we're going to need to talk about President Wilson and the Selective Service Act. So President Wilson is first going to encourage Americans to volunteer for service. He's going to say it's your duty uh, to fight overseas and protect the United States from uh, threats. And there's going to be a ton of recruitment propaganda like what we just looked at everywhere. Uh, the biggest factor in mobilizing, one of the biggest, is the Selective Service Act. And what that is, is it is an act that requires all men between the ages of 21 and 45 to register uh, to serve in the military if needed. So during World War I, 24 million people or men register for the draft and 4.8 million soldiers are going to get sent over. And of those 4.8, about 2.8 million of them are drafted. So the Selective Service Act is still around. Uh, I'm registered with it. And this is actually on the official Selective Service Act website, like as of now. Uh, almost all men ages 18 to 25, U.S. citizens or are immigrants, are required to be registered with Selective Service. So there's a couple people that um, uh, are not required to register, including uh, students, men in the United States that are students, visitors, dip are on diplomatic visas, or if you're a woman, you are not required to register. There are other exemptions for people uh, who have religious beliefs that prevent them from going to war and other exemptions for transgender people. So if you guys are interested in this, um, I will put the link up on Google Classroom for the Selective Service in case you want to know more. Okay, so the Economy and the Committee on Public Information. So the U.S. government is going to change its relationship with the economy by creating the Council of National Defense. So what that's going to do is it's going to give the government the power to regulate production of food, coal, and the use of railroads, which is huge. Uh, and the government is also going to create the War Industries Board, which is headed by a Wall Street broker. And what that's going to do is regulate prices, and it's going to tell companies where products are going to go. So this is the opposite of what you might consider a free market, where companies are just competing. Uh, without government oversight or without tons of government regulation. This is the opposite of that. Now the government is forcing companies to work together. And this is a picture of the War Industries Board. They seem like a really fun bunch. Okay, so the Committee on Public Information. A lot of Americans were asking the question, why are we at war? What, what's going on? I, I don't understand. I mean, I know that they sunk, the Germans sunk the Lusitania, but I don't know what we have to do with, you know, X, Y, Z. So the American government formed the Committee on Public Information to answer these questions. So they wanted to convince Americans that the war was a just war, that we weren't just fighting for the sake of fighting. So they sent out 75 million pamphlets, thousands of press, press releases, tens of thousands of speakers, meaning they sent people across the country to advocate for the war, and they put up millions of posters, including ones like this that say, beat back the Hun, which is another term that they used for Germans, uh, with liberty bonds. So they're telling you, you need to fight back against the Germans by buying government bonds and giving the U.S. government money to fight the bad guy who's blood-soaked and looks really scary and has a bayonet soaked in blood. There was um, a significant opposition to the war in certain parts of American society. But the government, the U.S. government, had a huge crackdown on anti-war speech in this time. So it passes, the U.S. government will pass the Espionage Act, which will ban treasonable newspapers, magazines, and mail prints. And it will make obstructing army recruiters, uh, aiding the enemy, or interfering with the war effort uh, punishable with a $10,000 fine, which back then is even more money than, you know, that is an enormous amount of money in World War I terms, and up to 20 years in jail. So if uh, aiding the enemy or interfering with the war effort could mean criticizing the war effort, it could mean saying, I don't think we should be in this war, or maybe it's morally wrong for us to fight. That would be something that might get you thrown in jail. Or if you were to put that in a newspaper or magazine or mail print, you would definitely get in trouble. The other act is called the Sedition Act, 
And this made it basically illegal to be disloyal to the United States government, the military, or uh, illegal to criticize the Constitution. So you could get thrown in jail, um, essentially, you know, without the protections given to you by the Constitution of the United States or the Bill of Rights. Um, I mean, this is a clear, these two here are clear violations of the First Amendment, which is freedom of speech. So the Sedition Act is going to target a specific groups. So socialists, pacifists, people who are against war and do not want to fight and political radicals. Um, one of the people that actually gets arrested is a presidential candidate, a then presidential candidate, Eugene V. Debs, who actually runs his presidential campaign from prison, which is pretty cool. He actually gets uh, quite a lot of votes for a third party. I believe he set a record. And this is an example of a pin for president, convict number 9653, which that's a pretty cool pin, I guess, if you're uh your pitch is that the guy you're running for president is a convict that's i mean it's uh interesting so that's all i have for you guys today in terms of the world war one home front and opposition um i will see you guys later and be posting more of these and if you have any questions please don't hesitate to email